let me be the first to welcome you to the 2023 conference on race, inequality, language, and education here at Stanford University. On the behalf of my colleagues, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today and encourage you to stay connected. We, we hope that this conversation is an opportunity for us to build capacity, to build community, and to continue to have discussions about ways that we can improve education for everyone. Uh, this year, our three-day conference is a little bit different. We decided to reconnect with Bay Area educators for a simple uh, and very obvious reason. We have the privilege to be among some of the best educators in the world. So this uh, three-day conference is brought to you with collaboration from our colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, San Francisco State University, Santa Clara University, the University of San uh, California, Santa Cruz, San Jose State University, and of course, our colleagues here at Stanford. So again, I welcome you to our conference today. Uh, more important, this particular three-day conference is focused on supporting educators. We want to empower our local educators to engage in conversations that will help you build the department, to help you engage in progressive thinking and improve the work that you're doing. So what are we doing for three days? Well, today we want to talk about affirmative action policy and its connection to views on race in the larger political landscape. Tomorrow, we will be talking specifically about mental health and what we can do to support the mental health challenges for young people. And then on Saturday, we'll engage in a in-person workshop where we invite you to come with, to come work with us, think about ways that we can collaborate to create empowered departments across the Bay Area. So today we're gonna to get started and we have a world-class group. I'm super, super excited to share with you uh, this group of people. Uh, I wanna start by giving some a macro level framework. Um, uh, when I was a young teacher, I, I was introduced to a framework that completely altered my perception on education. Dr. Mary Montel Bacon offered this idea of the generational educational dilemma. It was a simple idea. She said, do the math. When were people afforded full access to college education? And the idea was, if people like James Meredith and people uh, like the Freedom Writers were and civil rights activists were fighting for access to education, that did not happen immediately. And so who had opportunity? And her argument was that until the early 70s, people did not have full access to college education, rendering the second generation, those children born in the 70s and 80s, arriving to colleges in the 90s and early 2000s, the first full generation to have absolute access to college education. Well, affirmative action policies, which started in the 70s and ended in California in 1994, were intended to atone for the inherent inequality in the system. But there has been a paradigm shift. And with that shift, a change in attitudes, a change in policy, and here we are today with complete change in both policy and perceptions on race. And I couldn't find two better people to talk about that than Dr. Uma Jayakumar and Dr. Zeus Leonardo. To get us started, I want you to hear the voice first of Justice Jackson as she makes an argument that will center our conversation today is thinking about two applicants who would like to have their family backgrounds credited in this applications process. The first applicant says, I'm from North Carolina. My family has been in this area for generations since before the Civil War, and I would like uh, you to know that I will be the fifth generation to graduate from the University of North Carolina. I now have that opportunity to, to do that, and given my family background, it's important to me that I get to attend this university. I want to honor my family's legacy by going to this school. The second applicant says, I'm from North Carolina. My family's been in this area for generations since before the Civil War, but they were slaves and never had a chance to attend this venerable institution. As an African-American, I now have that opportunity, and given my family, family background, it's important to me to attend this university. I want to honor my family legacy by going to this school. Now, as I understand your no race conscious admissions rule, these two applicants would have a dramatically different opportunity to tell their family stories and to have them. All right. So we're talking about today, a movement from atonement to colorblindness and beyond. 
and I have the privilege of introducing our incredible scholars today. The first is Dr. Zeus Leonardo, who's a professor of education at UC Berkeley. His research explores the study of ideologies and discourses in education with respect to structural relations of power. His interdisciplinary work draws insights from sociology, contemporary philosophy, and cultural studies. In particular, he engages in critical theories to inform his analysis of the relationship between schooling and social relations such as race, and class, and gender. He is an AERA fellow, Derrick Bell Legacy Awardee, and a member of the National Academy of Education. And our uh, second scholar, who is a world leading scholar in issues of higher education and access, Dr. Uma Jayakumar. Dr. Jayakumar is an associate professor at the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Riverside. Her scholarship and teaching address racial justice and policy issues in higher education with a focus on how institutional environments such as campus climates and culture shape access and outcomes on how students experience and resist barriers to inclusive engagement. Dr. Jaya Kumar received her PhD from UCLA and her research has been generously supported through postdoctoral fellowships and awards from the National Center for Institutional Diversity, National Academy for Education and Spencer and the Ford Foundation. Welcome forward, Drs. Uh, Leonardo and Dr. Jaya Kumar. All right. So, our first question is for Dr. Jayo Kumar. Uh, so you have a, a wealth of insight as, about what is happening in this debate in higher education. Can you help our, our, our audience understand like what is literally happening with the Supreme Court and why does it matter? Sure, um, and thank you for the introduction. As Brian mentioned, I'm Uma Jay Kumar. My pronouns are she, her. I'm joining today from the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people, also referred to as Oakland, California. I'm honored and excited to be in conversation today with my colleagues and friends who I respect so much. Um, and I appreciate this first question and also um, Brian leading with um, Justice Jackson's voice. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Justice Jackson's profound impact a little bit later today. Uh, I did bring some notes, even though I was asked not to, uh, because I want to make sure to historicize this conversation, um, or at least the parts on affirmative action. So this past summer, the Supreme Court's conservative majority ruled that Harvard and UNC's race-conscious admissions practices violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. This joint decision effectively banned affirmative action at colleges and universities nationwide. Both cases were brought by a group called Students for Fair Admissions, um, or SFFA. And this is an organization led by a conservative activist and wealthy businessman, Edward Blum, with funding from his like-minded peers. Uh, and Blum has been on a mission to take down affirmative action, um, suppress voting rights, and um, and other rights to people of color. He was behind many statewide bans and prior affirmative action cases um, that have been at the Supreme Court. So the court majority banned affirmative action this time around based on SFFA's claims of harm to white and Asian American students. Even though SFFA's own experts were not able to show any evidence proving that UNC or Harvard used race as a tip in the admissions process. So the court ignored the actual evidence in the case, including lower court decisions that had shown that there was no evidence proving this. And this decision is connected to broader efforts like voter suppression, anti-CRT legislation, and book bans. It normalizes a legal fantasy of race neutrality that does not actually exist and in terms of higher education, it protects longstanding white advantages in college admissions. The second reason why the decision matters is that affirmative action was an important intervention to dismantle segregationist exclusionary white institutions. It started in the early 1970s as a robust program that boosted the enrollment of previously excluded students of color and enabled the building of counter spaces on these hostile campuses. Decades of litigation watered down the practice to focus on the educational benefits of diversity rather than reparations. Still, affirmative action was at best a remedial band-aid solution. 
It was a small but very important corrective because college admissions replicates and ignores longstanding racial advantages and disadvantages passed down through racial disparities and quality of educational access. For example, two decades without affirmative action in California's public flagships, UCLA and Berkeley, has meant token representation of Black students at 3 to 4 percent. And it's not just flagship institutions. At my own institution, UC Riverside, which is designated as a minority serving institution, there are also only 3% Black students. The third reason the decision matters is that affirmative action within the legal system stood as a threat to whiteness as property. Cheryl Harris's groundbreaking work demonstrates how whiteness is granted the legal protections equivalent to property rights. She shows how whiteness was sneakily enshrined as a property right during the Plessy case that established the separate but equal doctrine. But when the famous Brown versus Board of Education case overturned Plessy, it didn't overturn whiteness as property. But Harris also shows that affirmative action as legal doctrine had the potential to overturn the protection of whiteness as property within the law. So it was a threat. Uh, and in this way, affirmative action held radical possibility. It, so it mattered because it stood as a disruption to the, law, to the dominant legal white supremacist script. So to, to follow up on that, part of what I, I hear in your narrative is a deep connection to issues of race. Uh, Dr. Leonardo, uh, as the policies change, how does that reflect the change in perceptions on race in America? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Jaya Kumar. Uh, so wonderful to be on screen with both of you whom I admire. Uh, folks in the audience, uh, I really only want to make one point today. We don't you know, have an incredible amount of time, so I'm going to hammer a point home, which is that, I mean, my sense is that depending on what you're looking at in U.S. society, I am starting to sense uh, the rise of a new public race discourse uh, that I'm calling post-colorblind speech. Now, for this, I may have to zoom out from some of the, from the cases uh, recently and, and sort of take a more cultural critic or criticism perspective. And so, I'm looking at um, you know the rise of what I'm calling post-color blindness because uh, whites and whiteness over history have relied on multiple forms of race speech at any given time, even if one of those forms may be dominant or more accurately hegemonic in that particular moment. So the hegemony of color blindness, which we're familiar with, and I'll I'll say a little something about the term colorblindness and, and how it's become problematic for some folks. But I'm going to use it here because it's come back. You know, it's come back in the picture, particularly because of the Harvard case. Um, so that the hegemony of colorblindness as a public race discourse, right? As a way, let's say a public race philosophy that's that's um, uh, in the U.S. It does not suggest that it is only it is the only race speech form that is available. As for example. Jim Crow goes underground or used in private places, but does not therefore disappear completely. So as a discourse of what I call the transparency of racial power, epitomized by phrases like no coloreds here, heathen Chinese, brown monkey Filipinos, et cetera, Jim Crow was displaced and then later replaced by colorblind discourse. Colorblindness discourse, we should go back historically, grew out of the successes of the civil rights era making it therefore unacceptable in many public spaces, including our schools, to invoke race overtly. The mistake here is that this absence was somehow understood as this, the disappearance of racism itself, right? So it may have evaded race, but it was not racism evasive. It was race evasive. The preference from the 1970s on is to code, to cover up, and to covertly talk about race without apparently referring to it, such as using discourses of what we um, have cited as deservingness versus unearned, good versus bad choices, good versus bad values, or less disguised, but yet apparently uh, race neutral, um, uh, but 
you know, to the discerning ear are still racial, such as descriptors like welfare or lazy. The origins of racism and structures are grafted on individual problems, stereotyped cultural tendencies, and the unguided and invisible hand mechanisms of a free market. Uh, let me end here this, this segment. How, I'm, I'm arguing that, however, since at least the Obama era, recall the Tea Party, for example, and surely by the Trump era, we see a return to overt racial references. Here I'm speaking to build the wall, uh, referring to uh, the wall between the US and Mexico or Americans, quote unquote, versus Mexicans. The Muslim ban. And by Muslim, um, it wasn't talking about Indonesia, for example. It's talking about Arabs. Uh, or the Kung, Kung flu or Chinese virus for Chinese during COVID. These to me are hardly colorblind. Right? They are overt racial references. At the same time, my point is that multiple racial speeches are going on. The criticism of taking the knee in the NFL criticized by President Trump. The BLM, Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter seem more consistent with the discourse of colorblindness because they don't overtly refer to Blacks and African Americans in those phrases. Um, so as overt racial naming is attenuated and in associated instead with law and order in, this, in, in the taking the knee and therefore patriotism, right? I mean, it's not very overt. It, it's, it's still colorblind. So what I think the Trump era teaches us is that both can coexist, right? Post colorblindness is what I'm calling. And I'm only calling that because I don't have a better term for now. I'm still searching. So that uh, both were used, um, the overtness, of 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 post colorblindness with the Muslim ban, the the wall, uh, and colorblindness with taking the knee and the uh, law and order issues of the all lives matter. So it seems that colorblindness, while still arguably hegemonic, I would I would probably I probably lean towards uh, colorblindness as still hegemonic, seems to work alongside what I'm calling an assumptive race discourse, the the sort of rise of polar uh, co post colorblindness. Um, I have more to say about that, you know, but I want to end this little segment um, and, and go on to Professor Brown's next question. I, I want to connect the dots here. So your, your argument that we've moved from a, a, an area, a, er, era to a place where colorblindness is enacted, but it has an impact on policies and racial perceptions. And going back to Dr. Jay Kumar, how does the shift to colorblind ideologies impact what's actually happening in these university settings. I know your research is documented. Can you share your, your thoughts on how this translates to what students are experiencing? Sure, great question. Um, what comes to mind uh, is my research, a research project on white HBCU students, uh, racial frames and defensiveness. Um, and this was in the pre-Trump era. Uh, and that project taught me a lot about what we're seeing years later at historically and predominantly white institutions. The students uh, in our study exhibited race evasive frames that seemed more complex than Bonilla Silva's four frames of colorblind racism explained in his famous book, Racism Without Racists. Uh, white students a decade ago in predominantly black HBCU environments were experiencing the perceived existential threat to white identity and status that we see happening now. And they talked about race no longer mattering or shaping societal outcomes while simultaneously describing how their white identities were under attack. And we called this the disconnected power analysis frame because these students were aware of, of uh, had an awareness of structural racism and white privilege arguments. And it showed up in two ways. Uh, one group, were self-proclaimed liberal or progressive white students that talked about structural racism and privilege in theory, but appeared to mostly take actions that bolstered their privilege. And this allowed them to maintain their privilege while feeling anti-racist. And another way it showed up is where another group of white students applied a structural understanding of racism to turn that analysis onto themselves. So these students claimed that white people were oppressed by affirmative action and other anti-discrimination efforts. Uh, and some of these students in our study even talked about gaining admissions uh, through HBCU diversification efforts and scholarships. Uh, and the irony of 
that disconnect was completely lost on them. So I saw this line of logic about white students being unfairly and importantly, the difference was systematically harmed, whereas previous narratives um, on uh, you know race evasive ideologies were more focused on victimization narratives and didn't have that um, had that like equity component um, or abstract liberalism, but not a structural analysis. Uh, and we see this, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> with uh, many of the majority justices um, and how the discussion of harm, the harms of affirmative action were discussed kind of more on in, a, in the systematic harm type of way in SFFA's claims and in the recent Supreme Court deliberations. So I'll stop there. Yeah, it was interesting, you're, you're centering harm, right? Because the atonement paradigm was a recognition of a historical harm. And now we've seen a shift in focus to argue that the modern harm is because of a, a, a treatment system, an assessment system that accounts for race. It has not shifted to an account accountability for wealth. Uh, has not shifted to a, accountability for things like athleticism. So I, I want to talk about this shifting paradigm for race and go back to Dr. Leonardo. It, as we think about America's history for discrimination and using colorblindness as a, as a tool for admissions, how, how might we see this shift uh, applied to shifting frameworks? Let me ask that differently. I want to hear your opinion on how the shift to colorblindness as an ideology, and you're saying to a post uh, colorblind ideology actually will shape what's happening, what people experience in universities. As I mentioned or signaled earlier, I think we need to talk about the, these terms, right? So um, we're still using them, but you know, it's been cited that colorblindness is is at least ableist, right? That it is is on the back of, um, you know, what otherwise is called medical colorblindness or people with colorblindness. Um, and that we're using it as a metaphor on the backs of, of their experience. So that's one of the problems. But really, the other problem I see with the term is that it's misleading, such that it's, it, it's, it's more accurate to acknowledge that white colorblindness is a form of feigning to be blind to race <laughs> or color, right? So that instead of being simply blind to race or color, it is a selective seeing of race, and usually to maintain white interests and power. Uh, that is to see race when whites want to and not see it when whites don't want to. And it's not only whites. I mean, people of color can also uh, mobilize colorblindness, as we know. As uh, the legal scholar Gotanda reminds us in his excellent critique of the law and the Constitution's colorblindness or ostensible colorblindness, it is both un unsustainable and flatly false on some level. When he writes, quote, before a private person or a government agent can decide internal quote, not to consider race, close internal quote, he must first recognize it. In other words, we would we could say that one internalized quote, noticed race, but did not consider it. It closed both quotes. It's It's got internalized quotes. Um, or as Martinez documents in Hernandez v. State, a Mexican-American had been convicted of murder. Hernandez appeals that his jury was not comprised of his peers because it was mainly white. The court invoked that Mexicans were white under the law by, by 1950, at least, and therefore a jury of white peers did not violate the 14th Amendment. In another case, Mexican in, Rod, in the Rodriguez case, Mexican citizenship was up for determination, and federal naturalization laws then required that an alien be white in order to become a citizen of the United States. The court stated that Mexicans would probably be considered non-white from an anthropology anthropological perspective. Note here, anthropology is being used as a scientific definition of race. I'll return to that in a minute. And the court went on to note that the US had entered into certain treaties with Mexico, those expressly allowing Mexicans to become citizens of the US. So that Congress then intended the meaning of the naturalization of Mexicans to be white under the law. So this case, the Rodriguez case, reveals how racial categories can be constructed through the political process, including treaties. And so therefore, Mexicans became white under the treaty and the law. Um, I, I, my favorite one is the, the, case, the, the, the twin case of Osaka and uh, Bagat Thind, that earlier in the 1900s, you have Osaka suing the US for citizenship as a Japanese man who claimed by culture that he was basically American sometimes more American than recently immigrated Irish, 
Italians and Jews, that he had been here longer. The court struck that down and said that common sense, now I'm going to return to the science, anthropology, and common sense, that common sense uh, would look at, um, I'm sorry, science would look at um, Osaka as not white, even though common sense, culturally speaking, he was white. He was denied citizenship. Within three to five months, the U.S. removes Bhagat Thind, an Indian man's uh, citizenship based on the opposite uh, notion that though Indians were in the Indo-Asian um, part of the world, i.e. where the Caucasus Mountains hail, i.e. Caucasians come from there scientifically, Bhagat Thind may be scientifically white, but anybody looking at him would commonsensically notice and recognize that he is not white. So what happens here is that you have both sides a scientific definition of whiteness as anthropologically Caucasian, and the other side that whites are sort of culturally designated uh, racially, being used three to five months apart from each other, coming up with the same conclusion that both Osaka as a Japanese man and Bagat Thind were not citizens, therefore not white or not Caucasian. And how this might affect um, practice in um, universities is who is sort of categorized under affirmative action um, as belonging to certain groups. So there's some excellent um, ways to understand that, such as I'm thinking of an article by a scholar who suggested that, uh, you know, for example, Filipinos might want to think about uh, a different category for themselves, ourselves, speaking as a Filipino, um, uh, rather than going with sort of the Asian American category, um, thinking about a unique status as Filipinos, not Latinos, uh, which would be another option, right? There's this, there's a, the case that Filipinos are Latinos, but that would sort of occupy a, a, a problematic position within that history. But that um, to, to, to hail as uniquely Filipino under affirmative action, to take a position of affirmative action, not as diversity promoting, but anti-subordination policy. So that's how it's swirling around, right? It's swirling around. And I'm sort of plugging into a hole that I'm, 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 I'm using uh, post-color blindness to describe what I'm doing. Interesting. I, I wanna, uh, to, to kind of end this changing landscape, I wanna go back to this case where in a very public way, uh, issues of race were talked about. And, and Dr. Uh, Jayakumar, you received one of the greatest compliments that anyone could have is that your work was referenced and read and used in an argument by Judge Sotomayor. Uh, can you do us a favor and give, give us your reflections on how your work was used and, the, and just kind of share the argument that was made in that case? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'm, first of all, so honored to be cited in Sotomayor's powerful dissent. Um, although I have to say, that my favorite part is still when uh, Sotomayor tells the majority justices that their attempts to act like they care about BIPOC students' racialized experiences is, in her words, like putting lipstick on a pig. Um, I thought she did such a great job of calling out the hypocrisy of this ultra-conservative Supreme Court. Um, my study that she cited builds on a legacy of race scholarship, including Walter Allen's work, Beverly Tatum's work, and the work of so many other Black scholars that emphasize the importance of Black-centered educational spaces. I used structural equation modeling to demonstrate how critical mass and race-based affinity spaces reduce experiences of racial isolation, of tokenism, of hyper invisibility for blacks and other students of color um, at historically and predominantly white institutions. Um, so I like to visualize <laughs> Sotomayor uh, as using my work to give Justice Thomas the finger. Um, among his many racist arguments, Thomas claimed that affirmative action is unnecessary because it leads to self-segregation um, and separate race-based housing and student centers and organizations. And he claimed these things were harmful. Sotomayor names how there is no evidence for his ridiculous claims, 
And she uses my work to show that the opposite is uh, to be true. So it was uh, just a really big honor um, and um, for and an and acknowledgement of this legacy of work that values um, Black educational spaces. So now I want to go back to this macro issue. So we, we've kind of done some historical work here. We've kind of traced how with the shift of affirmative action, it's a reflection of shifts in race. The, the question that, that is important for the people watching today is what do we do now moving forward? If people are accounting for how race matters, then how does it matter? What does it matter? For, how does it matter for students as they think about their preparation for higher education? So I'm going to turn to Dr. Leonardo, who, who, who can give us some vision forward. What is the vision forward for how we want to communicate about how race matters in these considerations? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my work leads me to the conclusion that race is always in play, right? Race is always in play, but that it is a very shifting game that had it, it, it enters. And so that the, the notion of that I'm tracing called color, um, post color blindness is sort of documenting this change. Um, so I, I'm affected very much by studies of hegemony and just to remind the, the audience that it, it's, it's a concept from Gramsci that and to, to, to simplify it, it's really about the negotiation of power. In this case, the negotiation of racial power. And it is the sort of back and forth struggle, the wins over battles, you know, I, Gramsci calls them bunkers. So that I think the recent last 10 years or so, maybe 15 uh, at, at, um, farthest, they, going back to Obama rise, is, is this kind of uh, shift in the landscape of race towards whiteness and whites recognizing their own racial being. And that, to me, is very different. So to me, post-color blindness isn't just simply a return to before color blindness. It's not a return to Jim Crow. Because what I called Jim Crow a minute ago was that it was the transparency of racial power that, in effect, um, it sort of went without notice that white was human. You know, so e even those signs that we used to, you know, associate with that era of, you know, of no colors here, it really wasn't a sign for Blacks per se, because in a sense, Blacks understood their racial position. It was a reminder to whites themselves about their own sort of um, power in the situation. So I think that one need not be reminded that white meant human in that era, and white um, entitlements were just that. They were not to be justified. They were to be assumed. But I think post-color blindness is a new whiteness to me. And it is a sense that whites are asking for their deservingness as a racial group, which is really, really different from both color blindness, because it was not signaled, and Jim Crow, which is in a sense opposite of asking for something, right? Whites are now asking for something that they 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 understand through the identity politics of of non-whites in the last fifty years that they know that whites have learned from those strategies called identity politics. So I think post color blindness in our schools and universities has entered on you know the staircase of you know whites asserting their own whiteness, whites asserting their own racialness, whites asserting their rights as whites. And that's very, very, that has a very, very different feel to me because in a sense, they are in their own eyes, racial victims. That would not have made sense in Jim Crow, right? That would not have made sense in Jim Crow. Whites as Supreme could not at the same time think of themselves as victims, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But post-color blindness, um, tries to convince us that whiteness is being victimized. I'll, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, I just wanted to add or build on that to, um, to, to give an example of one way in which that shows up in uh, as we think about doing racial justice work at, in higher education institutions. Um, one thing that I've really noticed is that it complicates, um, for example, um, assessments of campus climate health. So assessments of um, 
you know, student sense of belonging on campuses, the need for counter spaces, uh, and the a conversation and an assessment process that's really been focused on, you know, racial justice and um, and historical truths. So we haven't had to be explicit about how that project, the project of do of improving campus climate health. Is a, is, a, is a project of addressing structural violence and racism. For those who have experienced uh, this structural vulnerability. Um, and in terms of doing campus climate work, it's really complicated by the white victimization narrative, structural narratives that Zeus is talking about that have become a new norm in this, in what he's calling a post colorblind. Um, world or higher education and society um, kind of discussion, discourse on race. So I think the important implication of that is if we utilize the same um, understandings of what do we do when students talk about their marginality and experiences of, of oppression, well, there's research that shows that creating counter spaces, creating student organizations, um, you know, providing them with a voice um, is important, um, validating their experiences, right? But as we saw at Berkeley a couple years ago, there was a group of students that were funded by um, external conservative organizations that brought Milo Stephanopoulos and some, I, I might be saying that name wrong, and some other conservatives to campus, right? And, 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 and claimed free speech in, um, in doing so. Um, but there wasn't a language or an ability for leaders to think about how they could frame this differently because they were co-opting the, the um, what has been the response of administrators in, in, in supporting oppressed, actually oppressed groups. So I think it's important that we're able to differentiate between um, between um, student experiences and look at it in the context of structural violence and an individual's vulnerability. And um, there's a framework within the medical field called um, structural competency that where there's a big shift in um, looking at um, patient care in terms in switching from cultural competency models to structural competency. And um, my recent work is is really thinking about, and I started this, um, you know, recognizing it, this when I was doing my expert report um, for on behalf of the student of color interveners, where they asked for critical mass to be centered and asked for UNC segregationist history and its ongoing impact to be centered um, in an understanding of what the campus climate was at UNC. And so it's gonna be important for us moving forward to be able to differentiate between and address students um, claims of marginality uh, very differently. I, I want to kind of frame this uh, without being overtly negative. Right? We have grievances from many groups now, whether it be white grievances, Asian grievances, uh, Latino African American grievances, all about one thing, which is college admissions. And so with the shifts in race, with the shifts in perceptions on how race should be used in admissions, I have a simple question. What, what gives you hope uh, that there is a, a better future ahead and, and what kind of insights might you share about what are the positive potential positive outcomes of this shift and how we're viewing race in college admissions? I'm gonna sidestep the admissions question. I think Uma I, um, would be more expert on that. Um, but to just continue along the lines of what I've been talking about, I, I think the turn towards post-color blindness isn't a complete victory for whiteness, right? Let me, let me say what, why I, um, what I mean by that is it was very difficult to talk about race within a colorblind era and perspective. I mean, the contradictions are obvious. But I think when whites claim whiteness, when whites claim racial identity, a conversation can then begin because they're at least in the room of race talk, right? And so I don't see sort of the Trump eras or it's called the Trump era, but it's not really about Trump, right? It's really 
larger than him, although he might like to think it's about him. Um, I think that the turn towards white identification is 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 that ironically gives me some hope, right? Because it at least can get us in a room and talk a common a common discourse of race, even though there are different meanings we might attach to it. So I think that co post color blindness is sometimes, on one hand, a victory, right, for white victimization. On the other hand, a sign of desperation. Because for so long, whites have had to rely on non-raciality, on colorblindness, on humanness, right? The minute they started to claim whiteness as a racial identity meant that it's a change in strategy, right? They, they've had to give up something, which was to admit to racial being, you know? And I think a conversation can then happen and what might be hopeful is you can pivot. I think there is, there are white people suffering. It might not be from whiteness, <laughs> it might, but it might be from economics, gender, sexual orientation and preference. So if whites can enter that space of victimization, maybe we can pivot, we can pivot because now we're at least talking a common language. And Dr. Jaya Kumar, I'd love to hear yeah. So let me jump in and, um talk about what gives me hope in this very depressing landscape for college admissions. Um, and maybe, and, and you know, I, I will want to talk about like actual um, possible interventions maybe a little bit later, but um, for now, what gives me hope um, was really, uh, you know, there was a whole year between when uh, social scientists and others filed amicus briefs in support of affirmative action um, and when we listened to the oral arguments, which happened about this time last year, to when the court's decision actually came out uh, in the summer. And during this year, I thought a lot about what gives us hope and what does this like supposedly race neutral context mean. Um, and it kind of felt like it was uh, a funeral for affirmative action in my mind, um, which helped me look, uh, kind of look past my decade long frustrations uh, in defending what amounts to a remedial policy. And having the benefit of hindsight, uh, I could begin to understand the significant threat that affirmative action could have been and therefore was to whiteness as property. And in this sense, uh, affirmative action was a radical disruption for as long as it stood within the law and the removal of it was an anti-Black policy decision. And here I really draw on Chesare Warren's work, which teaches us that it's important to recognize and mourn anti-Blackness to move toward new possibilities. So I think it's important for us to understand affirmative action, not just as remedial, but as a challenge to, as a radical challenge within a very white supremacist anti-Black legal framework. And I'm also comforted by Justice Jackson's profound presence um, on this ultra conservative Supreme Court. So Justice Jackson was, was recused from the Harvard case, but in the UNC case, she offered a hypothetical about two college students, the one that um, Brian led with, um, where one student, one applicant was black, one applicant was white, both fifth generation North Carolinians who said in their essays that they wanted to honor their family legacy by attending UNC. She pointed out that under race neutral admissions policy that SFFA was advocating for, race would continue to count in admissions, but only for the white student. So the white applicant's legacy and cumulative advantages would continue to be rewarded while the black applicant would not have his legacy and educational experiences counted because his is the only one considered to be about race. So under race neutral admissions, that erasure would be legalized and unchecked. Uh, Jackson first raised this in oral arguments where she argued against SFFA's demand that race not be allowed in the student's personal essay. And that shifted the actual decision that was made. She accurately <clears throat> named that this would 
be an equal protection violation for Black students. And her argument pointed to anti-Blackness, whiteness as property, and how the two relate. And she did this in a profoundly ultra-conservative Supreme Court. I'm really inspired by her activism and courage. Uh, she and Sotomayor were alone in many ways on this ultra-conservative court, but they stand with and are joined by communities and legacies of resistance beyond the court. And these legacies tied to new imaginings and futures and possibility are what keep me going and, and keep me wanting to think about how we can have a new college admissions process that actually de-biases the many ways that white advantages are counted over and over again in the process. So we're gonna we're gonna move to our Q and A. We're gonna start with a, a question from Gregory Pollard that reads: What are some implications for and new buttresses to standardized testing, especially at the K twelve level? in this new climate, it's interesting, because as the perceptions of race are changing, the assessments are changing. So let's think about these things together. What, what are your thoughts? I think the implications of this decision, uh, one of the silver linings of the decision, if, if there are any, is um, that we're no longer confined to the diversity rationale. Um, and so it's important that um, we leverage that to really start to think about and talk directly about addressing racism. Um, and, and in admissions specifically, um, it's important that we address the many ways in which there are uh, racial biases built into so many metrics. And one of those metrics, it, you know, in terms of college admissions is standardized testing. Um, so I think one of the important implications is there is so much research that shows that there's racial biases in standardized tests and the UC has made the move to not consider standardized tests. And, you know, there's always a danger of implementing a new standardized test. I was on a task force that voted against that, but I don't know who will be on the next task force and what those decisions will be, but um, really just being like, uh, really interrogating in a way that we haven't um, in the past 20 years, even without affirmative action bans in California, starting to really interrogate these um, these metrics and um, inequalities in K-12 education that end up being replicated and um, legitimized through the college admissions process. Um, I want to shift to another question. And this question is about admissions, but also thinking about the people making those admissions decisions. So one of our uh, participants asks, with the overturning of affirmative action, in tandem with the difficulty of its staffing admissions offices with BIPOC professionals, which includes uh, diversity of undergraduate admissions, uh, unfilled positions, including deans, associate directors, here's the question. What are the safeguards that should be used by admissions offices across the nation to ensure admitted student cohorts reflect levels of racial and ethnic diversity necessary in advancing a more inclusive learning environment grounded not only in DEI, but also in uh, justice and belonging frameworks. I need shorter questions, y'all. I, I, I like the question. I just need it to be shorter, but I appreciate it. I'll start with that and then I'll pass it over to Zeus. Um, it doesn't violate affirmative action to directly um, call for those racial justice frameworks in the hiring process to include them in the training process um, of admission staff. And it is important um, as, you know, BIPOC individuals are more likely to have understandings of structural racism um, and structural violence and the impact of K-12 inequalities and um, biased admissions metrics on um, on, on, on student of color applications. So I think it, we need to have a more justice oriented, community cultural wealth oriented um, value system and, 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 in, and, and taught within the admissions process and, um, I, and, and definitely including more um, people of color in that process can assist that. And it's important from a DEI standpoint, 
um, to keep in mind that this doesn't violate affirmative action. And this is, uh, universities are entitled based on academic freedom to pursue missions of diversity, to pursue missions of addressing racism and underrepresentation of previously excluded groups. And so they should be explicit about having those goals. Again, they're protected by academic freedom, the, the institution's own free speech to do so. All right. Final, yeah. final for, for both of you. Dr. Leonardo, where do we head from here with our perceptions of race and how it matters in society? What, what would you, you we're gonna we need you in charge. I, I would I would vote for you. What are we gonna do? And what, what 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 advice would you have for us moving forward? Well, I think we have to, in the spirit of somebody like a Derek Bell, we have to use, we have to be defiant in conditions of setbacks, right? That was his racial realism. And if we consider the turn recently with the Harvard case or even with the case of post colorblindness, I think we have to see them perhaps as opportunities or I, I, I think there's a crisis in whiteness that's going on. And I, I, I tried to describe that here, which is post colorblindness isn't just a, a white victory. It is a form of white desperation, right? Because they come out of the quote unquote white cave as white people, so to speak. And so I think we have to look on both sides of what's happening with race and see setbacks as potential opportunities to, to, to work with. And so like with the question of affirmative action, California has been doing this work for a long time. You know, I mean, we've, we've, we've had Prop 227. I'm sorry, uh, Prop 2, 209. 227 is a, another one. Um, and so we, we've been dealing with that. So places like Riverside and Berkeley have sort of been creative about how to attract a more diverse student po um, population, including outreach, right? Um, we have an excellent person in charge of, of admissions at Berkeley. We fondly refer to him as Femi. We just call him Femi. Um, and um, he has a fuller name, obviously. Um, and he has, you know, recently recorded one of the highest since the the height of affirmative action, one of the highest um, admission rates of African American and Black students to Berkeley. Now, whether or not they're coming is a different issue, right? But at at least we're doing a good job admitting, and that's partly outreach, right? Partly a sense of uh, belonging when they do get to Berkeley. So none of this contradicts um, that we can't outreach. None of this contradicts that once they're with us, that we do a good job of making folks feel and um and you know feel and sense their belonging so those are the ways that uh, i think california which has been doing this for for longer than other parts of the country are involved in so i think we we have to see setbacks as potential opportunities to do the work differently and to be honest to be honest about what was failing in the work of affirmative action right? excellent yeah uh, last qu question for Dr. Joe Kumar. Given how things have changed, uh, what should educators do in this new educational environment? Uh, thank you. Uh, for starters, uh, I want to caution against over-interpreting the Supreme Court decision. We all know some folks who want to cancel diversity or anti-racist efforts, and they'll use the SCOTUS decision to try to justify their actions. And others will pull back on fear of legal consequences. So it's important for us to understand and remember that the SFFA decision did not ban the consideration of students' racialized experiences in the college essay, thanks to Justice, Tom, uh, Justice Jackson. Uh, it didn't ban institutions from having diversity and racial equity as part of their mission or objectives. It didn't ban efforts to address racism on college campuses. The creation of affinity spaces, the creation of counter spaces, and thinking about third spaces as well. In fact, the majority opinion written by Chief Justice Roberts explicitly states, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. 
Um, this past week, the Department of Ed and um, a group of civil rights organizations, including um, the Legal Defense Fund, have put out recommendations for how institutions can apply and 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 take up this decision in ways that aren't over interpretive. Um, uh, and uh, so building on that, educators should ramp up practices that focus on critical mass or racial representation and the racialized experiences of BIPOC individuals instead of focusing on diversity generally. And this means talking more directly about how race, uh, how historical legacies of exclusion continue to shape minoritized student experiences in the present. And again, the silver lining about the decision is that we're no longer confined to arguments that focus on the diversity rationale. Um, and so we should be talking more directly about racism and its impacts. Uh, and another recommendation is to shift our focus to debiasing college admissions metrics, as I mentioned previously. Um, and we have to work on addressing and thinking about the multiple ways in which um, met these metrics favor white and wealthy students. And we've known this for years in terms of standardized tests, access to AP courses, and K-12 funding formulas. And some of my recent work has focused on other metrics, such as the way we count extracurricular activities, athletics, and admissions by exception policies. Admissions metrics also deliberately ignore racialized K-12 experiences shaped by segregation and the concentration of wealth in white neighborhoods and schools. None of this is race neutral. So efforts to debias college, college admissions um, can't be either. And um, debiasing college admissions, uh, shifting to this is not a violation of affirmative action. So this is something that can be done that is in line with anti-discrimination laws. And, and I, I just wanna say lastly that, um, as I mentioned previously, this is tied to an assault on gender and race curriculum, books, critical consciousness. So another recommendation for educators is just you know, emphasizing the profound importance um, more than ever of ethnic studies curriculum and programming. So really supporting um, ethnic studies programming in K-12 schools and higher education uh, and, and fighting these um, 500 plus um, anti quote unquote CRT legislations that are attempting to censor um, historical truths and, con and conversations and education that are, are, are the right, are the human rights of, of our student population. So. And I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, before we close, I'm going to call forward our own Dr. Antero Garcia, who's going to announce a very important new initiative we're launching here at the Graduate School of Education. Dr. Garcia. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Uh, I think just to those final comments uh, in the importance of ethnic studies, I just want to uh, share with all of you in the next uh, couple of weeks, we will be announcing uh, a call for proposals uh, through the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. Um, specifically about ethnic studies. I think our working title is Igniting Transformative Approaches to Ethnic Studies, Teaching and Learning in K-12 Learning Context. This is uh, seed grants for Stanford faculty, students, staff. Uh, we're specifically asking for folks to partner with outside organizations, schools, uh, organizations, communities, uh, and looking for that. Just to give folks a sense of timeline, we'll be announcing this call in the next week or two. Um, looking for kind of the best and brightest around what, what this work can look like in uh, specific communities and specific contexts right now. Uh, and uh, these will be due in December. So I'm, I'm trying to give folks a heads up because this can be due very soon. So it'll be due in December um, for a quick turnaround so we can get this work uh, up and running as quickly as possible in 2024. We'll be announcing these in January. So uh, keep an eye on the Accelerator page. If you're, if you're in the GSC, you will be getting um, plenty of notification from me and from folks uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but just want to kind of put this on folks' radar. So uh, thanks, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. So in, in closing, I, I just want to offer that uh, today is, is day one. On, on day two, we're going to hear uh, from scholars about mental health. And, and here's, the, here's the, the charge. If we can do harm to our young people, 
by the digital message they receive, then the inverse must be true. We should be able to engage in healing. And so we have an incredible group of scholars to come forward tomorrow to teach about how we might build healing environments in this new era. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to continued conversation. Thank you, Dr. Jay Kumar and Dr. Leonardo. You all have a great rest of your day.